Thank you for joining this OncLive Peer Exchange, which will feature a clinical discussion on next generation regimens for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Optimizing therapy for patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma remains a work in progress, particularly for patients with high risk disease. We continue to develop new regimens with the goals of obtaining deeper and more durable control of myeloma, as well as improving options for patients with relapsed and refractory disease. In this Onc Live peer exchange, my colleagues and I will look at the latest data from the ASCO 2018 annual meeting. We'll provide our personal perspective on the new research, new agents and new combinations that are being employed and considering how they will fit into current clinical care. I am Dr. Keith Stewart, the Vasic and Anna Maria Pollock Professor of Cancer Research for the Mayo Clinic based in Scottsdale, Arizona. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. A.J. Chara, an Associate Professor of Medicine, Hematology and Medical Oncology at Mount Sinai Hostel in New York, New York. Dr. Amrita Krishnan, Director of the Judy and Bernard Briskin Center for Multiple Myeloma Research and a Professor of Hematology and Hematopoietic Cell, Cell Transplantation at City of Hope Cancer Center in Duarte, California. Dr. Sagar Loniel, Chair and Professor of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology and Chief Medical Officer of the Winship Cancer Institute, Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Tom Martin, Co-Director of the Myeloma Program at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center in San Francisco, California. And Dr. Ed Statmar, the President's Distinguished Professor and Section Chief of Hematologic Malignancies at the Abramson Cancer Center of Penn Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's get started. We're going to begin with a discussion of uh, treatment approaches for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. And Dr. Lonio, you have published that the combination of lenalidomide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, or RVD is a standard of care in your institution. Is that true, do you think, nationally now? And if there is not RVD, what alternatives exist? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and, and I, I think after years and years of experience with RVD, I think it's pretty clear that RVD is a standard, probably the one with the most large clinical trial data supporting its use for newly diagnosed myeloma. I think the, the competitors in that space, if you will, is the use of KRD or carfilzomib in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, which also has some really encouraging data in small phase two studies, but so far we don't really have phase three data at this time point to really compare it head to head with and, RVD. And tell us a little bit about what we could expect with RVD. What kind of response rate and progression free survival are you seeing, or, or even uh, complete response rate? Yeah, if you begin to look at um, the, the overall response rate of patients receiving RVD, it's probably somewhere between 90 and 100 percent, depending upon which series you look at. Um, and uh, I think if you look at CR rates are better, it's probably somewhere around 40-ish percent, certainly for the first four cycles of treatment. Um, and if you look at KRD, it's probably not that different in terms of depth of response at four cycles. The real advantage that carfilzomib brings to the table is less peripheral neuropathy and the ability to potentially stay on KRD for a longer period of time than you could stay on VRD with fewer side effects. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to switch over to you, Tom. Is RVD appropriate in the more elderly patient or is it just for younger people? Well, I think for the transplant eligible, that RVD for sure is the number one regimen that we use here in the U.S. For the transplant ineligible, you have to make small changes in the RVD. So we call it RVD light and it's a published regimen. And essentially the regimen has lower doses of uh, Revlimid, lenalidomide, lower doses of dexamethasone. Typically we give weekly bortezomib and it's based on a 35 day schedule instead of a uh, 21 or 28 day schedule, what, you know, whatever you use, we have, there are different regimens. So with a 35 day regimen with RVD, it's very well tolerated, even in the transplant in ineligible, even in the frail patients. And I think essentially for almost every patient with newly diagnosed myeloma, you can use an RVD type regimen as induction and get the response rates that, that Dr. Loniel was saying, 90% response rate, 100% response rate, which is really great. I have a question for all you guys, and that is, so when you do it in the transplant eligible, how many cycles do you give before you take them to transplant? Good question. Ed, you want to respond to that? Well, the, uh, there's, there's no 
great data for this, though most of the studies took patients and, and gave them four to six cycles of, of therapy. Um, I think that most of the data suggests that, that you want to have a nice response. The number of cycles is really based more on, uh, on how the patients are tolerating the regimen and what kind of responses they're having. But in the old days, we used to maybe take two cycles and then send them to transplant. It's also looking like maybe a little bit more is better. But somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six cycles is usually what we're seeing. Okay, AJ, you've uh, published on carfilzomib in the newly diagnosed setting. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about uh, replacing bortezomib with carfilzomib and, and whether you're doing that or not. I think KRD has been shown to be a very effective regimen. Um, I would add that, you know, outside of clinical trial and real-world practice, we're not fixed to picking one regimen and sticking with it with a fixed cycle. You can start with VRD, and if you're getting a suboptimal response, you're getting neuropathy, switch to KRD. Uh, but the KRD data, I think, you know, people talk a lot about the toxicity, but it's important to really evaluate toxicity. You can't do that from a single-arm study. And when you look at controlled uh, studies, yes, there is a signal, but there, you know, we have neuropathy, secondary malignancies, uh, myelosuppression with other drugs, and we're comfortable managing that. Mm -hmm. And I think the key is, in the randomized studies, how common is it and does it affect the survival? And both Endeavor, KD versus VD, and Aspire, KRD versus RD, showed an OS benefit, showing that if, even if there is a cardiopulmonary issue, it's not so high that it's overcoming the benefit. And I think so the, the ways to kind of mitigate that are really looking at the patient, um, doing a baseline risk assessment if they have a cardiac history, and basically being a good doctor, monitoring their uh, symptoms and uh, signs after each cycle, minimizing fluids after the first dose, um, and minimizing steroid use. But at the end of the day, I think it's a very effective drug. Uh, I think it'll be interesting, probably the question coming up next would be, if these are the triplets, how is the addition of monoclonal, particularly yeah, CD38? We're going to get to that. Before we get there, so Amrita, are you using carfilzomib? And, and if so, what kind of patient would you select for that? So for the newly diagnosed, I'm using it in high-risk patients, younger patients. I'm pretty comfortable giving it to Does them. Does that serve the consensus of yeah. the group? Is yes. Anybody considering in a more elderly, frail patient, carfilzomib, or is that a step too far today? I think for the start of therapy, that RVD, especially in the elderly or specifically the frail patient, that's a good regimen to start with. If they are having neuropathy or they're having... Uh, side effects that we can attribute to bortezomib, then I have no problems actually switching them over to carfilzomib. And like Ajay has said, you know, you just have to control their blood pressure real, real well, control their fluids, and these guys can tolerate it fine. And, and for, the, for the, the older or frailer patient, I think sometimes less is more that you can use a lower starting dose of lenalidomide, a lower, a less frequent uh, bortezomib, as you were saying, um, the, the VRD light. Um, and, and, and it's more than just getting these medicines into patients, it's being able to continue these therapies for a long period of time. And I think the other issue with the elderly patients, it's not that the carfilzomib is a different drug. The host factors are tremendously different. As you get older, you have a lot more cardiopulmonary baseline comorbidities, and that, that's the nuance that interplays with carfilzomib. So it's important to uh, remind uh, the, the viewers that there is a big randomized trial happening right now in the United States, many hundreds of patients are receiving a VRD or KRD, and I think until that matures and we see some of that data, we're in a transition phase with these drugs.